Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, in earlier session we discussed on the meaning, definition and the scope of administrative law. In the present session, I will focus on the concept of rule of law. The rule of law, it is not a new concept. This concept is an old concept and it has been evolving with the time, it has been growing with the time. The rule of law, as I said, that it is not a new concept, it is as old as the civilization itself and it has grown, developed and evolved with the development of the civilization itself. The rule of law, as defined by Aristotle, he defined the administrative, the rule of law as the government of law as opposed to the government of man. In ancient time, if we see the various different forms of the rule of law, it seems that the Greek philosophers, they located this rule of law in the right region. This right region of Greek philosophers must, it, it means that the law must inform all the state actions. Aristotle, when he said that the rule of law means the rule of the government based on the principles of law, not the principles of man. He talks about the procedural justice and he also talks about the moral justice. The natural law philosophers like Thomas Aquinas and Saint Augustine, they located the rule of law in their law of God, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, they defined the rule of law in the form of the social contract theory for the origin of a state, in which the state was formed only to protect the life, liberty and dignity of individual. We all know that this social contract theory of origin of a state refers to the function of a state as to the security of the state from external threats from external aggressions and internal disturbances. The modern writers, they defined or they explained the rule of law or they located the rule of law in the form of quality of law which include clarity, stability, authority and the impartial justice. Friends, the rule of law is a higher law which provides an ideal which societies may enumerate with the growth of time and civilization. The rule of law, it represents an ideal situation. Ideal situation of what? It refers to the basic principles of natural justice, where there is no discrimination on the basis of weak and strong, on the basis of rich and poor, on the basis of the uh, literate and illiterate on the basis of any many other such elements there is no discrimination the rule of law represents that ideal situation of natural justice so the rule of law creates the ideal situation where all are equals it talks about the fairness the equality and the equity it provides the criteria with the reference to which one can evaluate law and legal structure of the governance. In India, ABC, in ancient time, the Upanishadic philosophy says that law is the king of kings, it is more powerful than the kings and there is nothing higher than the law. By its powers, the weak shall prevail over the strong. This is the strength of rule of law by the support of by the help of 
द रूल ऑफ लॉ द बीक शैल प्रिवेल ओवर द स्ट्रॉन्ग वी कैन अंडरस्टैंड दिस बाई टेकिंग द एलिस्ट्रेशन ऑफ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट जजमेंट मेड बाई द सुप्रीम कोर्ट ऑफ इंडिया इन यूनियन ऑफ इंडिया वर्सेज तुलसी राम पटेल इन यूनियन ऑफ इंडिया वर्सेज तुलसी राम पटेल केस द सुप्रीम कोर्ट सेज दैट नेचुरल जस्टिस इज नॉट द जस्टिस ऑफ नेचर वेयर द टाइगर डिवर्स अपॉन द एंटीलोप एंड द लैन फीड्स अपॉन द लैन द नेचुरल जस्टिस इज एन हायर लॉ ऑफ नेचर एंड क्रिएट्स द आइडियल सिचुएशन वेयर द लैन फ्रिस्क विद द एंटीलोप एंड द टाइगर लाइज डाउन विद द लैम दिस इज द सिचुएशन ऑफ द नेचुरल जस्टिस एंड द रूल ऑफ लॉ रिप्रेजेंट दीज हायर आइडियल्स ऑफ द नेचुरल जस्टिस रोमन्स दे कॉल्ड द रूल ऑफ लॉ आर जस्ट नेचुरली एंड वेन सर एडवर्ड कोक सेज दैट द किंग मस्ट बी अंडर गॉड एंड लॉ दिस वॉज ऑल्सो द फिलोसफी ऑफ द रूल ऑफ लॉ आज रिप्रेजेंटेड बाई द सर एडवर्ड कोक फिलोसफर्स ऑफ नेचुरल जस्टिस नेचुरल लॉ स्कूल डिस्कवर्ड दिस रूल ऑफ लॉ इन द फॉर्म ऑफ लॉ ऑफ गॉड एंड द नेचुरल लॉ इन मॉडर्न टाइम्स डायसी डेवलप्ड द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ रूल ऑफ लॉ इन रिलेशन टू द ब्रिटिश कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन द रूल ऑफ लॉ कैन बी अंडरस्टूड इन टू मीनिंग्स और इन टू सेंसेस the ceremonial meaning the formal meaning of rule of law suggests that it is an organized power against the rule of man another philosophical meaning or the philosophical sense or the philosophical aspect of rule of law refers to the adjustment the management and synchronization of the relationship of the individuals with the government it refers to moral social and behavioral code for the exercise of public power this code of public exercise of public power may be different from place to place from country to country the plan of action to apply this moral code this ethical code to regulate the relationship between the state and the individual may differ from country to country it may differ from time to time and the difference of this ethical code to maintain the relationship between the individual and the state it is always dependent of the social political economic educational cultural and religious needs of the society in a given time but at the same time it is also very relevant to note that there are some fundamental aspects there are some fundamental rudiments there are some fundamental values there are some fundamental principles there are some basic elements of the rule of law and these basic elements of rule of law are universally accepted and these covers all space and time these basic values of rule of law these basic or fundamental rudiments of the rule of law they are not dependent of the time and the space these basic components of the rule of law are equality freedom and the accountability here at this purpose the equality does not mean in its mechanical meaning or in its negative aspects whereas here the equality refers to its affirmative or positive aspects or positive elements the equality under the as the component of rule of law it always refers to the obligation of the state or the duty of the state to create such political social and economic conditions wherein every person can have the equal opportunity to develop and to have the equal participation in social and economic activities in this sense the rule of law refers to the social and economic equality the social and economic justice the modern concept of rule of law 
it also refers to the other two important components of the ideological or philosophical meaning of rule of law. First be discussed as the equality. The second one of that universally accepted and uniform component of rule of law is the freedom. Freedom means that state will not have the power to restrict the basic liberties and the rights of the individuals. The state must be under the limitation and must always respect those basic freedoms of the individuals. The freedom of the individual or the freedom as the component of the rule of law refers to the basic liberties, the right to life and personal liberty of individuals. It refers to the right to speech, right to expression and many other right to equality and many other such liberties, such freedoms or such rights of the individuals. The third such basic component of rule of law which is universally accepted, which is accepted irrespective of the time and space that is the accountability. Accountability that refers to the situation where the research to the demand that the state or the government must always be accountable to the people because the ruler it rules or he rules with the deference of people. It rules because of the recognition given to it or given to him by the people and therefore, he must always respect the considerations or he must always respect the basic liberties and freedoms of the individuals. He must always be responsible, he must always be accountable to the people on deference of which he rules and therefore, the accountability means that the each and every event of the exercise of public power, for each and every event of the exercise of public power, the holder of the public power must be capable of justifying it not only legally valid, but also socially and socially relevant or socially reasonable and fair. If we talk about the concept of rule of law, the meaning or the modern meaning of rule of law, this ideological or philosophical meaning which we discussed, which refers to the regulation of the relationship between the individual and the state. This modern and this philosophical meaning of rule of law was further developed by the International Commission of Jurists. The International Commission of Jurists also known as Delhi Declaration 1959. According to this formulation which was suggested by Delhi Declaration 1959, the rule of law means that the functions of the government in a free society should be so exercised as to create conditions in which the dignity of man as an individual is upheld. This is very important aspect of modern philosophical meaning of the rule of law as developed by Delhi declaration that the functions of the government in a free society should be exercised in such a manner so as to create conditions in which the dignity of man as an individual is upheld. So, under this obligation created by the rule of law, the state or the government, it is always obliged to create such conditions wherein the dignity of a man as an individual may be upheld. And this dignity of man to be upheld, it requires not only the creation of some civil and political rights or some civil and political conditions, but rule of law under this obligation also requires the creation of such social economic, educational and cultural conditions which are essential for the development of the personality of an individual to its fullest. It has always been the main concern of the constitution to provide for such social conditions, such economic conditions, such educational conditions, such cultural conditions to the individuals so that they may 
develop their intellect, they may develop their personality to its fullest. If we see the scheme of fundamental rights included in the constitution in the third part 3 of our constitution. These fundamental rights have been recognized by the constitution and these fundamental rights are conferred on the people of this country only for the purpose to create such civil, political, social, economic, educational and cultural situations. In the details of all the fundamental rights mentioned in part 3 of our constitution creates all these conditions which are essential, which are necessary for any person to develop his personality to its fullest. Under this modern meaning developed by Delhi declaration, the rule of law requires restrictive powers of legislature on the executive. Restricted power of legislature and the executive, it is the demand of, it is the mandate of rule of law that the legislature and the executive must have restrictive powers so that these may not unauthorizedly interfere in the freedoms or basic liberties or rights of the individuals or the people of this country. Under this requirement of restrictive legislature, the rule of law refers or the meaning suggested by Delhi declaration refers to the condition that the legislature should not enact discriminatory laws. The legislature should not enact the unreasonable laws. The legislature, the parliament should not be able to make the enactments in arbitrary manners in accordance with its own wishes and whims. The legislature should not be permitted to put undue restrictions on the basic freedoms or the rights of the individuals. This is the requirement of the rule of law. The rule of law also requires that the legislature should be such that it should not make the laws having retrospective effect or ex post facto laws should not be made by, should not be enacted by the legislature. It has also been the requirement or the demand of the rule of law under this meaning that the legislature should not interfere in the religious beliefs of the individuals. Restrictive executive in accordance with the meaning given by Delhi declaration to the philosophical meaning, ideological meaning of rule of law. Restrictive executive means that the administrative authorities should not travel beyond the limits of powers. We know that for any constitution to have the spirit of constitutionalism or to have the democratic pattern, the limitations of the administration, the limitations of the government should be defined and there must be some means and mechanism by which the government can be kept within the limits, within the defined limits of its powers. So, this is the demand of rule of law that the executive or the administration should not travel beyond the limits of its powers. And the second important demand under this meaning of rule of law is that, that there must be adequate safeguards against the abuse of power. There must be such safeguards by which the executive can be prevented, the government can be prevented to abuse its powers. These safeguards may include the principles of natural justice. These safeguards may include the fair procedure to be followed by the administrative bodies in performing their functions or in exercising their powers. These principles of natural justice may include further the rule of law, the rule of fair hearing. We know that this is the demand of rule of law that without giving the fair and adequate opportunity to the individual, to any person, the administration cannot take any decision. The decision must also be the reasonable decision. As I told you that the modern meaning of rule of law was also developed by Dicey. Dicey talks about rule of law 
and he proposed three important postulates to the meaning of rule of law. These three postulates or three components to the meaning of rule of law, three components of rule of law or three postulates or three propositions as to the meaning of rule of law proposed by Dicey are the supremacy of the law, number two, the equality before law and number three, the predominance of legal spirit. Supremacy of law means that no one can be punished merely by the commands of the government, but only for the breach of law. Supremacy of law means the law is the supreme and only the law rules. The supremacy of law means that nobody is above the law, the law is the supreme and only the law rules not the man. Only the law rules not the man, it further means that no one can be punished by the government, by the administration, by the authorities, merely by the commands of the government, but only for the breach of law and justice should be done through known principles of law. Justice should not be done, decisions should not be taken in accordance with the wishes of the authorities, whereas the justice should be done through the known principles of law. Supremacy of law means or it refers to the exclusion of arbitrariness in the governmental functioning. Why the exclusion of arbitrariness in the governmental functioning is essential for establishing the supremacy of law? We know that for maintaining the regime of the equality, which is the foundation for the preservation of all kinds of liberties, all freedoms, all the rights of the people or individual. The fundamental is the equality. Without the regime of the equality, these freedoms, rights of the individuals cannot be preserved. And the arbitrariness, it is always opposite to the equality. There is the, the, the enmity or there is anonymous uh, relationship or the relation between the equality and the arbitrariness and therefore, to avoid the arbitrariness, to exclude the arbitrariness, it is important to provide for such basic norms by which the government cannot take the arbitrary action. So, the exclusion of arbitrariness in the government functioning, it is also very important aspect of the rule of law under its first component, under its first postulate, under the first proposition to its meaning that is the supremacy of law. Under the supremacy of law, Dicey was of the opinion that there must be the regime of non-existence of discretionary powers in the hands of governmental officials. He was very critical about the discretionary powers in the hands of governmental officials, because he thought that when the discretion is in increased, whenever there is the room for discretion, there is always the room for arbitrariness and arbitrariness and the equality are sworn enemies. And therefore, for establishing the supremacy of law, it is essential that there should not be the discretionary powers in the hands of governmental officials, only then the regime of supremacy of law can be established. The second important postulate as to the meaning of rule of law proposed by Dicey was the equality before law. Under the equality before law, Dicey was of the opinion that there must be the absence of exemptions, there must be the absence of privileges for any person including the governmental official. He was very much opposite to grant any kind of privileges, to grant any kind of exemptions to anybody irrespective of his rank, irrespective of his status. But it seems that Dicey 
in saying that there must be the regime of non existence of the exemptions and privileges to anybody irrespective of his rank and status. He ignored the exemptions and privileges which were available to the governmental officials or the authorities and particularly to the crown in England. In the area of law of torts, there was a great privilege, there was a great exemption given to the king or the crown was that the king can do no wrong. And because of this exemption, because of this privilege, there was no tortious liability of the state. For any kind of tort being committed by the servants or by the employees of the state, there was no vicarious liability of the state. It could be removed only in 1947 when the Crown Proceedings Act was passed. Under the Equality for Law, Diocese says that there must be subjection of all the persons to the ordinary courts of the country irrespective of their status and rank. Diocese was supporter of the authority of the civil courts, the authority of the ordinary courts of the country and therefore, he says that all should be subjected to the jurisdiction of ordinary courts of the country irrespective of their status or rank. Either he is the prime minister or he is the constable, all should be subjected to the jurisdiction of ordinary courts. He also says that there must be the authority of law passed by ordinary legislature and everybody should be governed by the same. There should be the same law to govern all the people of the country irrespective of their rank, irrespective of their status. Under the regime of equality as proposed by diocese, there should not be any kind of exemptions, there should not be any kind of privileges to anybody, either these are the state officials or these are the ordinary persons. There should not be the special courts or the administrative courts, all should be subjected to the jurisdiction of ordinary courts according to the regime of equality as proposed by diocese under the meaning of rule of law. There must be the authority of law passed by the ordinary legislature, meaning thereby that diocese was the supporter of, great supporter of the law civil, the law passed by the ordinary legislature. And therefore, he always criticized the system of droit administrative wherein the law civil was not applicable and the legal principles and the legal rules being developed by these ordinary courts during their own course of functioning were applied or adopted. Dicey says on this point that droit administrative was to confer more and more powers on the administration and droit administrative was to disrespect the law made by the ordinary competent court. That was the reason Diocese marked the droit administrative as tyrannical and despotic intended to protect the guilty of administrative officials. That was the understanding of Diocese to the droit administrative that the droit administrative was tyrannical, droit administrative was despotic and the droit administrative was intended to protect the guilty administrative officers. The third postulate to the meaning of rule of law given by Dicey was the predominance of legal spirit. Dicey says that there has been the predominance of legal spirit. According to this predominance of legal spirit as suggested by Dicey as the third important postulate or proposition to the meaning of rule of law. The source of the rights of the individuals is not the constitution or any written document. According to Diocese, the source of all the fundamental rights, the source of all the basic rights and freedoms of individual is the 
common law of England. The source of the rights of the people is the common law of England means that rights of the people these emanates from the customs, the traditions and the great practice of English people duly recognized by competent courts. So, Dicey was of the opinion that the rights flows from the great traditions, great practices and the common law not from any written document, not from the constitution. Dicey says that the predominance of legal spirit means that the constitution is the byproduct of the constitution is the output of the common law and therefore each and every constitution should take the recognition from the common law itself. According to the opinion of Dicey, the common law is superior to the constitution and therefore the constitution is to take the recognition from the common law. Common law when he says that the common law is superior than the constitution, it means that the, the, the constitution itself flows from the common law and that is the reason that it is to take the recognition. We can understand at this point of our discussion that our constitution is different from this point of view of Dicey, where the constitution is to take the recognition from the common law and the source of the rights of the individuals, the source of the rights of the people is the common law or the great practices, customs or traditions of the English people, not any written document or the constitution. For India, the source of the fundamental rights of the individuals of the people of this country is the constitution and the constitution is not to take the recognition from anywhere whereas all the laws even these are customary laws these are to take the recognition from the constitution. We can understand it by taking the illustration of Hindu law. In Hindu law there are two kinds of sources of Hindu law the ancient sources and the modern sources. Under ancient sources Shruti, Smritis, Digest and Commentaries and then the customs and usages. Customs and usages are considered to be the great source of Hindu law, but for any custom to be the source of Hindu law is required to be valid and when any custom is valid for this there are some condition precedents that that custom must have some qualifications must have some prerequisites the pre there are many conditions to be qualified by any custom to be the valid custom and among these all the requirements or the conditions for any custom to be valid one is that that custom must be constitutional. So, the customs or practices or the usages or the customary law in India is to take the recognition from the constitution to be valid source of law otherwise that customary law cannot be valid. So, this is the meaning of rule of law as suggested by Dicey. If we talk about the rule of law in Indian constitution, the status and form of rule of law in Indian constitution, we can refer many provisions of Indian constitution, many principles of Indian constitution wherein the rule of law has been incorporated as the basic value. It is very important to note or to refer the idea of Plato and Aristotle in this regard that to what an extent the rule of law is important for any constitution or the rule of law the philosophy of rule of law is important for any government for any state to survive. Plato was of the opinion that where the law is subject to any other authority and has none of its own the state will collapse. Plato says 
that where the law is subject to any other authority and has none of its own meaning thereby if the law is subjected to any other authority the law is subjugated to any other authority then the state will collapse and if the law is the master of the government and state is slave then the situation is full of promise and men enjoy all the blessings of god that god showers on the state so for the happiness of the people for the welfare of the people it is essential that the government must be slave to the law and law should be the superior value aristotle says that the law should govern and those who are in power should be servants of the laws therefore the rule of law is the condition precedent for any constitution to be democratic for any constitution to be to represent the regime of welfare state or to ensure the welfare of the people of that country here at this point of time here at this point of discussion we can also distinguish between the rule of law and rule according to law when i say that the rule of law is the condition precedent for any constitution to be democratic for any constitution to represent the basic values of welfare state it means that there is a difference or there is a distinction in the rule of law and rule according to law the rule according to law can also be found can also be seen in an autocratic system where the government is run by some norms though these norms are the words of the dictator or the autocrat but the system is run in accordance with those words or those norms being devised by the autocrat himself that is the situation of rule according to law but the rule of law does not mean only the rule according to law rule of law is it is of higher law of nature and it refers to the ideal situations it refers to the ideal conditions so the, there is the distinction in rule of law and rule according to law the rule of law in itself include the rule according to law but rule according to law may not include the situation of the rule of law if we see such form of rule of law in indian constitution so in indian constitution the rule of law is not mere abstract concept whereas it has been materialized it has been put in its pragmatic considerations with it pragmatic considerations in its pragmatic form under article 14 of our constitution the article 14 of our constitution refers to two important concepts the equality before law and the equal protection of laws dicey talks about the absolute equality he talks about the absolute absence of non existence of any kind of exemptions any kind of privileges any kind of special courts any kind of special laws to anybody irrespective of his rank or his status dicey talks about the non existence of the discretionary powers in the hands of state officials but in indian constitution under article 14 when dicey says that there must be the equal law for everybody or all should be governed by the equal law being enacted by being made by the ordinary legislation but in indian constitution under article 14 the principle of the doctrine of reasonable classification has been devised which means that only equals are governed equally or only equals can be treated equally non equals cannot be treated equally if non equals are treated equally then it will further result into the state of inequality
and therefore to group the persons of same kinds in one group and to govern those people by one law and to put the different kind of people or things in the second group and these are to be governed by the different law. And this regional classification later on became the basis of social and economic justice in India. So, in India the rule of law it is not only in the abstract concept it has been materialized, it has been put in its pragmatic form under article 14 by two important considerations the equality before law and the equal protection of laws. The equality before law under article 14 also provides for the protection against the discrimination, unreasonableness, arbitrariness in the case of E. P. Royappa versus state of Tamil Nadu in the decade of 1970s. The Supreme Court of India is held that the article 14 also provides the protection against the arbitrariness. So, article 14 is not limited only to the reasonable classification whereas, it provides for the protection against the arbitrariness and the ultimate objective of the theory of rule of law either it was proposed by ancient philosophers at the different phases of the time of history or by the great Indian saints and philosophers in Vedas, Smritis and Upanishads or by Daisy himself in the modern meaning given to the rule of law. The ultimate objective of rule of law has been the avoid to avoid the arbitrariness the ultimate objective of the rule of law has been to minimize the arbitrariness in the governmental functioning and to put forward the justice based on the known principles. It has been the ultimate objective of the rule of law and the Supreme Court says that article 14 provides for such protection against the arbitrariness. All the constitutional and governmental functionaries are required to act within the limits set out by the constitution. Here in India we know that the supremacy of constitution prevails. The example of the supremacy of law as proposed by Dicey, we have materialized it into the form of the supremacy of the constitution in India. And all the governmental actions either these are executive actions or these are legislative actions. These are to confirm the basic constitutional principles and no governmental functionary can act contrary to any constitutional principle or any constitutional provision. And therefore, the Supreme Court of India in the case of Pancham Chand versus state of Himachal Pradesh in the year of 2008 rightly observed that all constitutional and governmental functionaries are required to act within the limits set out by the constitution. If we talk about the rule of law in Indian constitution, so the article 14, the fundamental rights, the power of judicial review in the hands of the courts, the independence of judiciary, the concept of free and fair elections, all these constitutional concepts, these recognize the rule of law in Indian constitution. What is the status of the rule of law in Indian constitution? We can understand by going through some important judgments or some important observations made by the Supreme Court of India in different judgments. For example, in the case of Ravi Chandran versus J. A. M. Bhattacharya, which was decided by the Supreme Court of India in 1995, the rule of law was explained very beautifully. The Supreme Court says that the rule of law on judicial review are the basic features of the constitution as its integral constitutional structure 
इंडिपेंडेंस ऑफ जुडिशरी इज एन एसेंशियल एट्रीब्यूट टू रूल ऑफ लॉ इफ देर इज वन प्रिंसिपल विच रन थ्रू द एंटायर फेब्रिक ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन इट इज द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ रूल ऑफ लॉ एंड इट इज द जुडिशरी विच इज इंटरेस्टेड विद द टास्क ऑफ कीपिंग एवरी ऑर्गन ऑफ द स्टेट विद इन द लिमिट्स ऑफ लॉ देयर वाई मेकिंग रूल ऑफ लॉ मोर मीनिंगफुल एंड इफेक्टिव दिस इज द ऑब्जर्वेशन मेड बाई द सुप्रीम कोर्ट इन रविचंद्रन केस देर आर टू इंपॉर्टेंट ऑस्पेक्ट टू इंपॉर्टेंट फीचर्स ऑफ दिस ऑब्जर्वेशन विच एक्सप्लेन्स अबाउट द नीड एंड इंपॉर्टेंस ऑफ रूल ऑफ लॉ and the status of rule of law in indian constitution the supreme court says that rule of law and judicial review these are two important parts of the basic structure of indian constitution these are two integral part of the structure of indian constitution we also know the fact that the doctrine of basic structure of indian constitution the basic structure doctrine of basic structure has been evolved by the supreme court of india in keswanand varthi case wherein it has been established very clearly by the supreme court that the basic elements or such elements of indian constitution which form the basic structure cannot even be amended by the process of amendment or under the plenary power of the parliament under article 368 to amend the indian constitution the basic values the basic ethos the basic principles the basic ideas of the constitution cannot be compromised even by the process of amendment of the constitution the supreme court when the supreme court says that the rule of law and the judicial review these are two basic part of basic structure of indian constitution and integral part of the structure of the constitution that means that the rule of law is very important for indian constitution it is ingrained as basic value basic principle as the basic element of the structure of indian constitution and judicial review the power of judicial review of the court it is to make the rule of law more meaningful and effective in the case of binay chand mishra which was decided in 1996 the supreme court says that the rule of law is the foundation of a democratic society and the judiciary is the guardian of rule of law in a democracy like ours where there is a written constitution which is above all individuals and institutions and where the power of judicial review is vested in the superior court the judiciary has better role to perform that is to see that all the individuals and institutions including the executive and the legislature act within the framework of not only law but also the fundamental law of the land there are some important judgments which has been delivered by the supreme court of india by explaining the rule of law and by holding that the rule of law is the part of basic structure of indian constitution you can refer to indra nehru versus rajnarayan decided by the supreme court of india in 1975 p sambhamurthy versus state of andhra pradesh somraj versus state of haryana Menka Gandhi versus Union of India ADM Jawalpur versus Shivakan Shukla Keswanand Bharti versus State of Kerala AK Krapak versus Union of India these have been very illustrious cases to understand the status of the position of rule of law in Indian constitution now one important aspect which also requires some light to which requires some discussion that is the relationship between the rule of law and the administrative law particularly in the background of the opinion of dacy 
that the administrative law is opposite to the rule of law, Dicey was of the firm opinion that the rule of law and the administrative law, these are two discrete values, these are two opposite values. And the development of administrative law is violative of rule of law. That is the reason Dicey said that in England there was no administrative law and the English people they do not need any law like the administrative law because they are ruled by the rule of law. That was the understanding of Dicey to the administrative law influenced by his understanding to the system of Dwight administrative in France. So, he was opposite to the development of administrative law in England. But if you see the development of administrative law vis a vis rule of law in England, you will find that the administrative law and the rule of law are not two discrete values. Dicey also, Dicey could also understood this fact when two decisions was delivered by House of Lords, the Board of Education versus Rice and local government board versus Arliss. Up to the 1915, when both these decisions were delivered by the House of Lords, Dicey could understand that the administrative law had developed in England. In these two decisions, the House of Lords was of the opinion that the administrative authorities could also determine the question of law. By saying it, the House of Lords recognized the administrative adjudicatory powers of administrative adjudicatory powers or the adjudicatory powers of judicial powers of decision making powers of administration. That was the starting point of the new administrative process in the name of administrative adjudication and therefore, the IC could understand that now in England the administrative law had developed. If you see all this development starting from the publication of a book with the title New Despotism by uh, Lord Hewart and ending with the recommendations of Donogmore committee, recommendations of Frank's committee, recommendations of justice, the international, uh, the, the English wing of international commission of jurist. If you see all this development where two important enactments were made by the British parliament. Number one, the statutory instrument act 1946 on the recommendations of Donogmore committee and number two, the tribunals and inquiries act 1958 on the recommendations of Frank's committee. Then the adoption of the institution of ombudsman, all this development if you see carefully, all this development of administrative law was for the preservation of the rule of law in England. If we go to some extent to this history of the development of administrative law in England, then we can understand that how Dicey was wrong in believing that the administrative law and the rule of law, these are two opposite or discrete values. When in 1929, Lord Heward published the book, New Despotism, he showed his concerns about the sustenance of maintenance of preservation of rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty principle because of the increased power of the ministers. And this publication of the book created very heat by the discussions all over the England due to which the British parliament had to appoint Donogmore committee to investigate into the area of delegated legislation or the rule making power being conferred by the parliament on the ministers. There were three important questions before the Donogmore committee, whether 
the rule making power in the hands of ministers or the executive was violative of rule of law whether it is it was violative to the parliamentary sovereignty principle and if it is violative of rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty principle then what are the safeguards the donogmore committee submitted its report and on the basis of the recommendations made by donogmore committee one enactment was passed that is the statutory instrument act 1946 to regulate the area of delegated legislation when the claim made by the owner of the land in crucial down affair was tackled negligently and franks committee was appointed on the recommendations of the franks committee the tribunals and inquiry was passed these two major developments in the history of england relates to the development of administrative law are to regulate two new administrative processes one the delegated legislation and other the administrative adjudication and all these enactment two enactments were passed for the sake of the rule of law for the preservation of the rule of law and therefore we can say very authoritatively that the administrative law and the rule of law these are complementary supplementary to each other the administrative law in this modern complex regime of welfare state is to supplement the rule of law and i would like to say that the administrative law can be the very effective and if i say that it is the only means in this complex form of the government in the welfare state to achieve the objectives of rule of law or to preserve the rule of law or to permit the pre of uh, rule of law to prevail in the governmental functioning the administrative law is very effective means it is to supplement the rule of law and therefore the rule of law and the administrative law these are not two opposite concepts whereas these two concepts are complementary to each other these two concepts are supplementary to each other and the administrative law is to the administrative law is necessary for regulating the functions of the administration and to allow the rule of law to prevail thank you hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet we usually know william shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of english literature but we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature and here i am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize a long sections from macbeth or king lear or julius caesar uh before they can go and sit for their school and or college exams but i am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors tolstoy for instance considered the writings of shakespeare to be and i quote crude immoral vulgar and senseless george bernard shaw absolutely loathed shakespeare as he did homer but perhaps no other criticism about shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller provided someone 
has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.